Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Adam Thorns, and I am proud to be the superintendent of Chicago Ridge School District 127 and a half. I wanted to thank you for taking a few moments today to watch this video message where I'm going to discuss some of the Illinois State Board of Education's opening guidelines for next fall. Last Tuesday, uh, the Illinois uh, State Board of Education sent us a 60-page document discussing uh, the reopening guidelines in phase four uh, for schools for next year. I've, ha I've had a chance along with all of our uh, leadership team to really look through this document. And I think one of the most important things that we want to make clear is that the school year will not look like business as usual. Even though the state is really encouraging us to get as many students as possible back into the classroom, we understand that it is not going to look like it did at the start of last school year, or really look anything like any of us have ever gone through before. It's also important to note that all schools using or uh, serving pre-K through 12th grade students are subject to these ISBE guidelines. We all need to be following uh, the same guidelines and regulations that they have set forth in here. We have also been told that we need to make sure that we are preparing for a return to remote instruction if there is a resurgence in the virus. And what that means is that any time throughout the school year, uh, the Illinois uh, governor can decide that we need to go back to remote learning just like we began uh, in the spring of last year. So we need to be ready for that. And school districts are also now allowed to utilize both remote and blended learning days which uh, means that students can uh, be doing their schoolwork remotely uh, on days as well as a blended model where sometimes they are in the building and other times they are doing their schoolwork at home through the computer. The Illinois State Board of Education did work with the Illinois Department of Public Health to really provide uh, guidance as far as what we can and cannot do uh, when we open schools in the fall. And one of the biggest items of guidance that they, they sent to us was that uh, there is a requirement for the use of protective, uh, personal protective equipment, often known as PPE, uh, and this includes face coverings. Uh, most of us know this as wearing masks. They're also prohibiting more than 50 individuals from gathering in one space. And a lot of questions are, what is one space considered? And one space is considered a classroom, uh, a gymnasium, a lunchroom. You can't, no matter how large your space is, at this point you are not allowed to have more than 50 individuals in there at any one time. Another piece of the Department of Public Health's guidance is to practice social distancing as much as possible. And I think we all know that with students that this, this could cause some, some difficulty and uh, I'll touch base on that a little bit later in our presentation. We also are required as schools to conduct symptom checks uh, and temperature checks every single day and or that individuals self-certify that they are free of symptoms before entering any school buildings. And for right now that is required daily uh, to occur as well as uh, a requirement to increase school-wide cleaning and disinfection, which I will touch base on in just a little while. <clears throat> so moving forward, uh, there's a few things that I, I wanna make sure that our community understands that, that we take very seriously and that we feel that are important. We do have a task force that is made up of 40 different members uh, from all different areas of the school district, from teachers to paraprofessionals, to uh, custodians. We have two parents from each building uh, on this task force as well as uh, two board members from the Board of Education. And we really want to make sure that people know that we believe that the safety and well-being of our students, staff, and families is paramount as well as providing a high quality and equitable education experience. And those are the two things that we are really focusing on throughout this entire process. We also understand that there is a need to be flexible and supportive. That's uh, flexible and supportive of each other, as well as for our families. Uh, we understand that every single family is in a different situation um, moving forward into the fall, whether it's, it's the need for, for daycare or how, how we feel um, about this pandemic and, and the need to get students back. We understand that there are a lot of different feelings out there and we want to uh, be very respectful of those. 
We also believe that it's important to maintain our calendars as best as possible. I know that one of the hardest things last spring uh, was on a Friday. Uh, we had to send out a message to our families that said, uh, school is being closed down for the foreseeable future and uh, families having to scramble and really to figure out what they were going to do. And we wanna make sure that if, if it's going to be a school day, that, that we know that it's a school day. And that doesn't mean that school is gonna look the same. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be eight to three every day. But if we have a school day on the calendar, we wanna make sure that it continues to be a school day. We're also anticipating that adjustments will need to be made and we want to continue to clearly communicate with our community when this occurs. Uh, I said at the very beginning that we have to anticipate that at some time at some point we might be told that we are going to remote learning. We don't want to wait until that moment to have a plan in place like we were forced to last year but we want to continually uh, be in communication with our families and our community about what our options are moving forward. And then the final one is to continue to work with our community partners. Uh, the villages of Chicago Ridge, the village of Oak Lawn, as well as uh, the Chicago Park District, Chicago Ridge Park District, and the Chicago Ridge Library have been awesome partners throughout this uh, entire endeavor. And we wanna continue to communicate and work with them to do what is best for our students. And my final message before I go into our survey results and some of the questions that were asked is really that we can do this together. Uh, we are in unprecedented times right now and we understand uh, that there are a lot of opinions, a lot of thoughts on what, what can happen in the fall, what should happen in the fall, but I really want to stress that we are going to do what we can for our students and whatever mindset we go into this, I, I truly believe that students are going to follow. If we go in with a positive, we can do this, we can figure this out and, and do this together, I really feel that our students are going to be looking forward to whatever uh, comes their way in the fall. I wanted to thank all of you who filled out a survey, we had 528 surveys that were completed, which is by far the most responses we've ever received to anything that we filled out. And that really helps us to gauge um, how, how parents, how families are feeling. And, and I will be very honest, the, the answers were very split down the middle. Uh, one of the first questions on there was, how comfortable are you sending your students uh, to school in the fall? And we had 54% of the respondents say that they were comfortable and 44% uh, who said that they were not comfortable. And I, and I do believe a lot of that comes just uh, from the unknowns of, of not knowing what the school year is going to look like, what precautions are going to be put in place, and, and really where we are going to be as a state in terms of uh, the pandemic. Are we gonna see a rise in cases? Are we gonna continue to, to stay on the lower end where we've been the last couple of weeks? But I do believe that, that that goes into a lot of why people feel uncomfortable at this point. I did want to touch base on some of the more common uh, comments and questions that we received over and over again in the survey. I, I also want to preface that by stating that we aren't able at this time to answer any of the detailed questions, but I, I am very happy that, that those questions were sent to us. Uh, we were able to compile those and keep those in mind as we are working through the plan, but it is very difficult right now to answer some of these specific questions as uh, the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health continue to, to adjust and, and tweak what the guidance is. And a perfect example of that is our face masks required for all students. And from the very beginning, that, that has been the definitive yes. Uh, school districts do not have a say in this, that they are required for everyone over the age of two, uh, unless there is a medical note uh, from a physician that says for medical reasons that a uh, student or staff member can, cannot wear the mask. Um, so they will be required uh, every single day. Um, they are allowed to take them off uh, to eat during, during lunchtime and, and breakfast. Uh, but for the rest of the day while they are inside that they need to keep these on. And we are very aware of how difficult this could be for students and staff. I know uh, the difficulty I have wearing it uh, throughout the day. And when we talk about some of our younger students, that is going to be something that we have to keep in mind. And I believe one of the things we need to make sure that we do is provide breaks uh, when the weather uh, allows for, for our students to get outside, to breathe in that fresh air. That's gonna be really important. We also thought this week that one of the accommodations that we were gonna be able to make was offering, instead of a face mask being worn, that a face shield 
uh, could be worn. And, and uh, the Illinois State Board of Ed on Friday uh, said yes, that, that would be allowed. And just yesterday they released uh, updated guidance that said no, that they are not going to allow that for our students. So that's just one of the examples of, of things that continually change on us as we uh, have, to, have to tweak our plans moving forward. Another question is how will social distancing be practiced? And we know that, that this is a major concern uh, for students. We are, we are talking about kids who normally like to be around each other, uh, who many of them have not seen their friends in a, in a long time. And we also know that the, the best teaching practice is when kids are working together in groups and solving problems. Um, but as we said before, uh, this is not business as usual and our schools are gonna have to look a lot different. And um, we have given each principal uh, the ability to order what they felt they needed inside their buildings, uh, whether it's, it's creating one-way hallways and having arrows so that students are not constantly passing each other in the hallways, uh, to the social distancing stickers to be placed in uh, places where students might congregate uh, to remind them you need to keep that distance. Now inside the classroom, uh, we are going to remove as much excess furniture as possible. And the guidance has really been to social distance when possible. And um, desks are, are hopefully going to be separated as much as, as we can. But the guidance has also been at this point that it should be three feet or, or larger. And there was also some guidance uh, from the Academy, the American Academy of Pediatrics that, this week that also said uh, three feet for deaths to be apart, if not more. And I think the key is to make sure that we limit uh, the amount of time that students are up and, and passing each other um, so that they are at their desks and then taking an entire class break uh, when they can get outside. And how will symptoms for students be checked? And there are really two different areas that we are investigating at this point. Uh, one is the daily temperature check uh, as students either come to school or get on the bus, making sure that their temperature uh, is with underneath the 100.4 degree uh, temperature range uh, before they are allowed admittance into school. The other option that the state right now is giving us but had, needs to do some clarification on that is uh, really the self-identification, uh, going through a li list of symptoms and, and having the temperatures checked ahead of time and either electronically or through a sheet of paper uh, that the student would bring to school uh, showing that they have uh, checked their symptoms for that day. And right now the state is requiring, whether it's temperature checks or self-identification, that that would need to take place every single day. So we're just waiting for a little more uh, clarification uh, from the state, like all school districts are at this time. The other question is, what other precautions are, are being discussed right now? One of the things that I was most proud of our district uh, back in the spring is uh, that we did have a lot of hand sanitizer, uh, we did have a lot of Clorox wipes, and uh, the Chicago Ridge Police Department had, had asked if we had any extra hand sanitizer, if we could provide that, uh, so we were able to do that. Uh, working with one of our families in the district who had, had brought to my attention the need for Christ Hospital for Clorox wipes, we were able to donate large quantities of those uh, to the hospital when they were in need. Um, we also realized when we did that that we needed to order our own supply uh, and well beyond what we've ever ordered before. Um, so we have ordered hand sanitizers. We are uh, in the process of, of getting uh, hand sanitizers in each classroom uh, on the wall. Uh, we are also uh, in, invested in providing our custodians with equipment that they've never had before uh, to make sure that we can uh, continue to clean uh, larger areas and even the small areas um, as well. So those are some of the precautions that are being discussed. We've also mentioned making sure that um, we spend time with our students to talk to them about washing their hands appropriately. And that goes all the way from our younger students up to our junior high students and the importance of doing it and the importance of doing it uh, the right way every single time. And so those are just some of the precautions that are, that are gonna be taking place. Uh, we will definitely make sure that we include that in our plan to the community of a list of all the different things that have been put in place to keep us as safe as possible. At this point, I think the most important thing that we can continue to do is have an, have an open line of communication. I know that families, I know that students, I know that staff, I know that myself are, are very anxious about what is it going to look like in the fall. 
Um, at this point, I think it's important to remember that we really are looking at a moving target where things are constantly changing, uh, not only by the hour, but by the day. And uh, what we have ready right now might be completely different from our reality in uh, the six weeks before our school year starts. But I do think that it is very important to keep those lines of communication open. And I really do encourage that if you have specific questions um, that you email me, I have my email address right here. Um, and I'd be more than happy to email back or, or spend a few minutes on the phone uh, talking through those concerns or questions. Uh, as I said earlier, I think it's extremely important uh, that we are all in this together and I think we'll be able to, to do some amazing things moving into the fall. Uh, but please reach out if you have any questions. And I want to wish everyone a, a happy 4th of July weekend and we will talk very soon. Thank you.